So to turn to the end of scene one here on page 66, act four, scene one, bottom speech from line 199 till the end, and we get one of the high points of this play, where Bottom describes his dream in so far as he can. He first thinks that he's somehow still in rehearsal at these He's waking up and uh, he thinks he's still in the last moment of normal reality uh, before all of the strange things happen to him overnight. Uh, and then begins to, uh, to recollect the strange events and to call them a dream. So line 204, he says, I have had a dream past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if you go about to expound this dream. Methought I was a, there is no man can tell what. Methought I was a, and, and methought I had, but man is but a patched fool if he will offer to say what methought I had. So what is he saying? So uh, the old fashioned word uh, methought and its, its um, other verb forms, uh, we, don't, we don't say that anymore, but you, you can see what it means. It's just uh, a combination of other words. Uh, so when he says, me thought, that's him saying, I thought. Uh, and he begins by saying, it's past the wit of man to say. So nobody is so intelligent that they could understand what happened to me. I don't know what it means or what it was, but... Uh, and no human being could say. Uh, man is but an ass. So he's, he's still making a joke about his, his former condition. Uh, it's just an expression to mean something like I'd be a, a fool or an idiot. Uh, if I tried to expound this dream, if, uh, if I tried to, to give it a, to make it into a lesson or, or to teach its meaning. Uh, and this seems as essential to uh, the, the best apprehension of the dream that we get in this play, that the, the power of it, the importance of it, in some way the meaning of it is that it cannot be assigned meaning. What is it? It's, it's a, a mortal being loved with a, a higher than mortal creature, uh, some ordinary human being like us receiving the favors from the, the highest rank of things in the universe. And uh, that's not a thing to be explained. Uh, the proper explanation is you, we don't know uh, why that would happen or what it would mean if it did. And of course, it's, it's not simply a, an ordinary human being like us, but someone lower than us because Bottom has been translated into half an animal. Uh, he's he's sunk down. His appetites are are simpler and less human. All he wants is a little bit of hay, some dried peas to munch on. Uh, so, the extreme contrast is even more extreme than if some divine creature fell in love with one of us. And uh, so. The thing to say about that is what Bottom says. Not to have an explanation, but just to reflect on, on its pure character of resisting any explanation. And this, of course, is, is in some way what love is, right? That it, it raises us up to our best self. So, uh, People who would hate ever to write a simple sentence will find themselves writing poems. Uh, though people who are generally selfish will find themselves doing uh, courageous and generous uh, things under the power of love. So it raises us above ourselves. But of course sinks us down below ourselves. Uh, that when you fall in love, the things that, that you really want are so low an animal that we always do them 
uh, in private out of, uh, we, we wouldn't let anybody else see us doing them because, uh, because in some way, because they are so low and this is a human instinct to cover up all, all low things. So this, this dream is just typical of anybody's experience of, of love. It, uh, it mixes the highest and the lowest and jams them together. And Bottom is probably wise, although, of course, Bottom is a great fool. Uh, but but he's, he seems to be wise in some things. He's wise that uh, when the greatest love of his life comes along, he accepts it. Uh, uh, but bottom is bottom is a great fool, but he seems to be wise here that he doesn't attempt to explain the meaning, but just accepts that the meaning is to be found uh, in the utter nonsense of it, the complete mismatch, the, the, the combination of things that shouldn't go together, uh, but things that do go together. So he goes on, we're now on line 209. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. So uh, if you study the reference works, you will see that's a, a kind of botched reference, a mixed up reference to things in the Christian scripture about uh, true faith in God. Uh, and that may add meaning to you, or or it may not. The first thing we see is that, of course, it it, it makes no sense. Uh, eyes don't hear, uh, ears do not see, and that nonsense goes all throughout. But of course, it's it's better to say it this way, uh, in this very foolish and mistaken way. It's better to say it that way uh, than to straighten it out. Uh, but he says the eye of man has not seen or the ear of man has not heard. Uh, that uh, wouldn't be nearly as good. And, and it backs up the general quality of this experience. That, that there's no accounting for it. It can't be brought under, under reason. And so what he ends up saying is that it should be celebrated in art. Uh, it should be turned into poetry and song. So at line 212, just after where we stopped. I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It should be called Bottom's Dream because it hath no bottom. And I will sing it at the latter end of, the play, of a play, before the Duke peradventure. To make it more the gracious, I shall sing it at her death. So... He seems to be thinking that he'll include it in the play for the Duke's wedding, thinking forward to what he's going to do, uh, coming back to, to normal life. He's thinking about the work he's got to do today and less about the dream he had last night. Right. His bottom instinct, which is probably correct, that uh, beautiful experiences should be solemnized, uh, made made more important, made, made sacred by displaying them to the grandest human beings. And to put it in a play before the most important human being that he knows would be a, a way to respect this dream. Uh, and perhaps it belongs as a, a kind of add-on, uh, addendum to the tragic play they're going to put on for the, for the Duke's wedding. But I've started at the end of the quote and to, to back up. And then he wants Peter Quince. So Peter Quince is the, the man who wrote the Pyramus and Thisbe play and is, is sort of directing uh, their effort as a play. He wants him to, to write a, a ballad that is a, a song lyric uh, that tells the story of the dream. Uh, and then line 215, I, I leave to you. Uh, because it seems to, it seems to sum up the whole. Uh, that it, it, the dream is called bottoms dream because it doesn't have any bottoms. Uh, of course, that is completely illogical and makes no sense. 
But, but then to be illogical and make no definite sense is appropriate for this situation. It's true of everything else uh, in this play and in the events and in the dream and in his reflection of dreams. Things that don't make sense are more, more powerful than things that do. Uh, and to have no bottom would mean you, you couldn't get to the bottom of it. Getting to the bottom of it is an expression for understanding a thing, being able to account for it. Some crime is committed, you get to the bottom of it. When you catch the criminal, something yeah, is missing and you don't know why. And to get to the bottom of it is to figure out what happened to it. Uh, but this dream you cannot get to the bottom of. Uh, and that, of course, is its power. It doesn't, it doesn't have a bottom. You can sink down deeper and deeper uh, and not explain it, uh, but perhaps make it more poetic. And you'll see in the, in the next scene, uh, Bottom goes back to normal life. He, his, his friends are all despairing that his disappearance has ruined their play. They were expecting a great success and to get a pension and to be supported by the government for the, the great success of their artistry. Uh, they're, they're depressed when suddenly Bottom shows up and... Uh, gets them back in a happy mood again. Now they're looking forward to the future. Seems to be you know, Bottom's character. He's he's a fool and, a, and an ass and a great ego. But he's one of those people who can supply the zest and enthusiasm in life. Turn people from their dull reflection on the on the death of their hopes to, uh, to being eager to do stuff. Uh, and... Uh, he, we see him, he brings forward uh, his experience and it's a thing that makes him special. He's not just an ordinary worker because he has in his heart the memory of this dream. So here on page 67, scene 2, act 4, line 29, Bottom says, Masters, I am to discourse wonders. That's a, uh, guys, have I got a story to tell you. But ask me not what, for if I tell you I'm no true Athenian. I will tell you everything, right as it fell out. Uh, the Quint says, let us hear, sweet Bottom. Okay, you've got a great story, tell us. And then Bottom says, not a word. So he's clearly taking this story forward. Uh, the specialness in his mind exists in having the story to tell, uh, but telling it would spoil it. Uh, he's he's starting his post dream life, uh, where he has uh, a secret he cherishes uh, that makes him not a normal human being because, uh, for a brief time, he he had the most perfect experience, uh, even when he was at his his least perfect self.